What up, May Inc., man? What's going on, brother? How you doing? Definitely got to reach out to you, man. I got to, uh, I'll reach out to you too. Got a show coming up uh, this Sunday if you're available. We'll definitely be a part of that. Uh, this new Black Wall Street book club guy is going to get into our evening reading of our Black History series, part four. Uh, be going through three different books um, African American Adventures that Changed the World, Black History Reader by, that was by Michael Carson, Black History Reader by uh, Dr. Claude Anderson. And defining moments in history, reading between the lines by Mr. Dick Gregory. Hey, we're gonna get this party started, guys. Man, hit the like button, share button, all that good stuff, man. Mr. DJ, uh, hit that music so we can get this thing going. New, new, new black, new, new black Wall Street book club. Evan Jefferson, brother, much love. Educating, elevating, because in knowledge is the power that will never give it up. <laughs> Literature is for the masses. When to put your money down the high to watch your assets. Yeah, uplifting others is a passion. My brother Evan, he will turn it into action. New Black Wall Street Book Club. You should come read with come us. us. Yeah, we comprehend and discuss. Yeah. We all just come together. There's no limit for There's us. No limit for us. <laughs> It comes your host, New Black Wall Street. Evan, take it away. New Black Wall Street Book Club. Hey, good evening to you, billionaires, man. Thanks so much for joining us here today on the New Black Wall Street Book Club, where black folk do read. Uh, you put in a book, we absolutely will find it. I'm your host, ERGJ, your certified financial educator, CEO, VRGJ Enterprises, ERGJ Black Bazaar, and international best selling author of the book, The Black Billionaires Club. Uh, that book that arose, The Study of Black Wealth. It's a study of the 12 richest black people in the world today and how they built their wealth. And I just truly believe that if you want to be wealthy, you should study wealthy people. But you can go to the website, theblackbillionairesclub.com, which you see here right on the screen. Uh, and there you will actually uh, be able to uh, find the book itself, uh, soft copy, also available in ebook. And then also we have it available in French and ebook and audio book as well. Uh, check out the website, theblackbillionairesclub.com. That's right, theblackbillionairesclub.com. Pick up your copy today. And man, thanks so much for joining us, man. Let us know for those that are here live with us here for tonight's uh, uh, tonight's presentation, uh, where you are connecting from, what city, what state, what country, what city, what state, quite, what country, quite possibly. We're broadcasting here live on Facebook, YouTube, and also Instagram uh, from our studios here in Decatur, Georgia. That's right, Decatur, where it's greater. And we'd love to know exactly where you are connecting from uh, as you are participating with us here tonight for our Black History series, we are into part four. That's right, Black History series part four. Again, we'll be going through three different books. Uh, one will be uh, African American Inventions That Changed the World by Mr. Uh, Mr. Michael Carson. African American Inventions That Changed the World by Michael Carson, a Black History reader. 101 Questions That You Never Thought to Ask. This book was written by Mr. Dr. Claude Anderson. And our main text for tonight will be Defining Moments in History, uh, Reading Between the Lines, a book written by the late, great Dick Gregory. Uh, so I hope you guys are ready to find out a little bit about an, an inventor, uh, get a social question answered that you might have been at, you might have asked before or that you never, th never thought to ask. And then hear uh, a history from the mind <laughs> of Dick Gregory. Our sponsor for tonight. Uh, first, we have uh, ERGJ Black Bazaar, the Afrocentric Marketplace. And there we also have books available for you to pick up as well. Uh, check them out at ERGJBlackBazaar.com or TheBlackBazaar.com. Do have the Black History uh, activity books. Uh, we are still in Black History Month, so go ahead and pick you up something for yourself or something for your niece, nephew, or child. Uh, give them something that actually has historical content, Black historical content with our Black History activity books. And then all the sponsors for tonight, help us pay the bills, is Big Sis Media. That's right. Big Sis Media Group is a, a full service creative design agency uh, that is uh, that that it, with tools available to help clients communicate with audiences through visual and digital media. Uh, so if you need help with websites, you need help with uh, any digital uh, content, uh, any video content, contact Big Sis Media to get the help that you need. They're going to watch over your most critical creative needs like a Big Sis would. Uh, you can check out the website at uh, BigSysMediaGroup.com. That's right, BigSysMediaGroup.com to get the help and the assistance that you need. All right, guys, that's the, that's the announcement. We'll get right into this thing here tonight. Again, our Black History Series. Everybody put in the comments, so had, uh, every comments is a little Black History. Let's see who's joined us here tonight. Nicholas Richardson, man, thanks so much for joining here from Detroit. Good evening to you. Char, 
Sarasay, Sarasay, Miss Powell. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us from my Lancaster over on Facebook. Uh, Vivian Reed, Brooklyn, New York over YouTube. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Miss Taylor uh, over Instagram. Thanks so much for joining us as well here tonight on a new Black Wall Street book club where Black folk do read. So we are going to start, guys, tonight with our... Um, I got to get rid of that. We're going to start here tonight with our African-American inventions that changed the world. African-American inventions that changed the world. And I just think, uh, you know, history is so, so important. Uh, we need to capture our own history and start uh, make sure that we uh, convey that history and not wait on someone else to try to tell the black history, uh, especially within this country. So just doing my little part to be able to share some great quality books written by black folk. Uh, that kind of share our history. And tonight, our inventor of the night uh, is going to be Dr. Charles Richard Drew or Dr. Charles R. Drew, as you may know him if you've heard of him before. His inventions, guys, was the uh, Dr. Charles Drew was a surgeon and a medical researcher. Uh, he conducted research in the field of blood transfusions while developing improved techniques for blood storage. He also pioneered the first large-scale blood collection program in the United States during World War II. Uh, in 1942, he patented an apparatus for pre preserving blood. Dr. Drew was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2015. I find this very interesting. He did all this stuff back in 1940, and it took about 100 years uh, later before he was inducted into a National Inventors Hall of Fame. But nonetheless, he got in there. Dr. Richard, Charles Richard Drew. Now, he was born in 1904, uh, and he passed in 1950. Wow, he was only 46 years old when he passed away. Here's a little background about Dr. Richard, Dr. Char Charles Richard Drew. He was born on June 3rd of 1904 in Washington, D.C., and as a young man, he was an athlete and honor student. He graduated from Amherst College before studying medicine at McGill University in Canada. A little bit about his inventions. In the late 1930s, Dr. Drew invented a new way to process and preserve blood plasma. Uh, he designed and patented an apparatus that allowed blood to be stored and shipped in the event of it being needed for transfusion. Prior to his invention, blood was perishable and not fit for use about, after about a week. His new method vastly improved the efficiency of blood banks. Dr. Drew work, Drew's work took on new urgency during World War II. As the leading expert on blood storage, he worked on a project with Great Britain to oversee blood banks for British troops. In 1941, he was named medical director of the American Red Cross National Blood Donor Service. He recruited and organized a collection of thousands of pints of blood donations for American troops. It was the first mass blood collection program of its kind. At the time, the United States Armed Forces segregated blood from African-American and Caucasian donors. Dr. Drew was outraged by this policy. He was frustrated and spoke out against this racist and unnecessary practice. The military refused to change their policy, and he ultimately resigned. He then stayed, started working at Howard University, serving as a professor and the head of the Department of Surgery. Later in his career, Dr. Drew was the chief surgeon at Freedman's Hospital. He was also the first African-American examiner for the American Board of Surgery. The first African-American uh uh, examiner for the American Board of Surgeons. Mr. Consistence up in the house from Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, so our inventor and invention of the night, Dr. Charles Richard Drew, uh, inventor of an apparatus for preserving blood, which we still use today. And, um, you know, uh, conducted research in the field of blood transfusions. Uh, Dr. Charles Drew tonight here on the New Black Wall Street Book Club. We put some respect on your name. All right, man. So that is our inventor of the day. That's our first little portion. Again, that's coming out of a book written by uh, Mr. Michael A. Carson, uh, African-American Inventions That Changed the World. African-American Inventions That Changed the World. We'll just go through one a day and kind of just mosey along in a way. Uh, we you know, start reading some people that we may not have heard of before and keep this thing going. All right. So. The second part of our night here tonight in the New Black Wall Street Book Club, our Black History Series. This is part four. So if you missed any of the previous series, just check us out on YouTube or Facebook, uh, ERGJ Enterprise. Those are where um, those sections will be. We are going to be uh, getting into 
uh, Dr. Claude Anderson. Now, Dr. Claude Anderson is a, a brother who uh, wrote uh, Powernomics. Uh, he also has written. Uh, he's one of the, the you know one of our thought leaders when it comes to economics. Uh, he's written a book called Black Labor, White Wealth. So you might have heard of Dr. Claude Anderson. Uh, his I don't know if this is his newest book, but a book that he 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 he's recently written is called A Black History Reader. A Black History Reader, 101 Questions That You Never Thought to Ask. So if you are a Dr. Claude Anderson fan, well, have you read any of his books, any of his literature? So our question that he's going to ask us here tonight and bring in, uh, some, some insight into it is this question. Question number four. What is the history of today's diversity policies? What is the history of today's diversity policies? So let's read what Dr. Claude Anderson has to say about today's diversity policies. The word diversity was not selected at random. It has a purpose. The purpose of the policy of diversity was to divert resources, attention, opportunities, and population power away from black Americans. Uh, today's diversity policy is simply the old anti-black policies wearing a new set of clothes. The primary goal of the diversity policy after re redirecting resources from blacks is to obliterate the unique role blacks played in the development of this nation and to give a mythological impression that all groups contributed equally to the development of this nation. Nothing could be further from the truth. The diversity concept is designed to keep blacks powerless and impoverished, obscure the social construct that socioeconomically cripples blacks, and then give rights, resources, and protections earned by blacks to newly fabricated and cobbled together minority groups. The concept of diversity was first introduced into American society centuries ago in the slave codes of 1705. The diversity provision in the slave codes was a method to maintain racial balance in numbers and to monitor blacks when they aggregated. Diversity procedures regulated the number of blacks who could gather at one time and kept them under surveillance so that whites could be alerted to and avert to and avert any efforts which might in ignite insurrections. To effectively manage large black populations in the South, the Diversity Act mandated that a slaveholder must have at least one white person to control and monitor every four black slaves brought into the colonies. The slave to white ratio was difficult to keep in the mid 1700s because England, the chief slave trading nation, wanted to have as many slaves as possible in the colonies in order to produce as much commercial product for England as possible. To prevent or reduce the possibility of blacks and the native Indians forming a coalition to drive whites back to Europe, when the black slave population reached nearly 40% in 1750, white colonial planters requested the British government do two things. Number one, reduce the number of slaves being shipped into the Southern colonies. And number two, send more Europeans to be in the management class in the South, but in the North to do the reverse to import four whites for every black so the nation's majority population will remain white. Colonists in the South wanted to prevent slaves from escaping to nearby Florida, which was Spanish territory and where the slaves would be free Spanish citizens upon arrival. The colonists therefore established a new colony, Georgia, as a buffer between South Carolina and the Spanish territory of Florida. A primary purpose of the Georgia buffer zone was to impede black slave runaways from escaping South Carolina plantations and migrating to a slave sanctuary in Spanish Florida. To secure the buffer colony and to maintain the required ratio of blacks to whites, more white bodies were needed. To meet that demand, colonial powers convinced the British government to empty its prisons, poorhouses, and insane asylums and ship large number of white immigrants to settle in the newly established colony of Georgia. Meanwhile, the Spanish government and the Catholic Church continued to encourage slaves to come to Florida. Hundreds of slaves successfully escaped into Spanish Florida. When they were granted land, and where they were granted land, and became settlers and free citizens. The Catholic Church, the official church of Spain, and the power source behind the Spanish crown typically assisted the escaped slaves to establish themselves in the new country. The 1705 Diversity Act included a provision that required white males to be members of the local militia, to bear arms, and to perform slave monitoring duties. All communities had to have plantation police or paddy rollers to, to monitor the movement of slaves and to patrol for runaway slaves. The diversity provision 
that require whites to be the dominant population and possess arms to control and monitor slaves was the foundation for the Second Amendment to the United States Constitution and to establish a tool to establish and maintain a country for a free white population that controlled everything. White population domination was the stated national goal, but the reality was quite different. The North had limited use for slaves. In the South, plantation owners needed black slaves for labor, and blacks were the dominant population in many of the colonies. When the diversity policy was the first initiated in 1705, the slave population was nearly 40% nationally and over 50% in the Southern states and was continuing to grow. The North saw expansion of the black population as a threat. Southern plantation owners could not achieve a majority white population because cheap white labor could not compete with free black labor. And white immigrants did not want to migrate to the South and Southern culture. As a practical matter, the plantation owners accepted large black populations, but devised cruel physical and psychological control measures that were so horrific and brutal that the slaves endured intense fear, pain, anxiety, and continuous terror. They were not permitted to be human. Uh, some died from their experiences, but most gave in to the conditioning and did not revolt. The slave owners took these measures to protect themselves and to control the majority. By the time the Civil War began in 1861, states like South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and Georgia had black populations that were approaching the 50% mark. The Diversity Act, everybody put in the comments on diversity. The Diversity Act that required white men to carry weapons and to monitor slaves led to the Second Amendment that was included as a requirement in the United States Constitution. Today, 160 years after the American Civil War ended, the diversity concept in race matters has again reared its head. Just like in previous centuries, present day diversity policies devalue blacks and equate every, nearly every newly fabricated minority to the historical struggles of black Americans. In 1978, the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in favor of Alan Bach accelerated the shift from black to diversity. Bach was a white medical student who claimed that preferences given to blacks were the underlying cause of his rejection from medical school and that those preferences amounted to discrimination against him. A minority opinion stated that there was no constitutional justification for preferential treatment for any group other than black Americans, but the majority sided with Bach. Public and private policymakers responded. They adopted the language of civil rights, but applied it to diversity, which only nominally included blacks. And in reality, benefited groups more acceptable to the public. Groups that did not conjure up uncomfortable images of slavery, segregation, or black power. White policymakers knew that the shift away from corrective preferential treatment for blacks to generalize diversity would be de detrimental to blacks. The policy shift of unearned entitlement to groupings of diverse people was made behind closed doors, deemed politically correct, then announced to the public. Liberals felt that growing op opposition from whites would impede any corrective actions for blacks, so liberals switched gears and eagerly embraced diversity for any certified new minorities as a new national civil rights goal. Black civil rights leaders who, since they were politically powerless and had gone as far as they could go, followed liberals by embracing diversity and political correctness that made blacks invisible. Having knowingly sold their people, uh, the civil rights establishment kept silent and promoted the newly fabricated minority classes with the hope that some blacks might inadvertently benefit through diversity inclusion programs and political correctness attitudes, which were popular in mainstream society. Both government and the private sector accepted the legal diversity rationale with the clear understanding that blacks would be nearly excluded from preferential treatment and public resources diverted to the newly fabricated minorities. The federal government's failure to enforce the nation's immigration laws enabled a massive influx of legal and illegal Hispanic immigrants to enter the United States. They soon surpassed the native black population and became a majority minority and the nation's preferred minority in terms of receiving benefits and privileges. By the year 2000, such large numbers of Hispanics had entered the country that they displaced blacks in population and from the nation's consciousness. Blacks moved down from second class to third class citizens. 
The reduction of blacks to third class citizens gave Hispanics greater political leverage than blacks in voting potential, business development, and the public consciousness. The preferential immigration policies that sparked the growth of Hispanics were in response to the gains blacks made during the civil rights era. By 2014, there were 55 million Hispanics in the United States, making up more than 17% of the population. 93% of Hispanics have been in the country less than 40 years. Since the year 2000, Hispanic organizations, authors, and media personalities publicly boast that they have made blacks obsolete, replaced them as the majority, major, majority, majority, and made them instead the minority, minority. Adhering to a trickle-down belief, Hispanics argue that Blacks have had their day. The diversity concept, as a public policy, offers a menu of preferred gender or ethnic groups from which the white overclass can choose to direct resources and opportunities. Diversity is a broad and ambiguous concept, which hides from public view who actually receives the targeted benefits. Traditional politicians and policymakers embraced diversity and put a screeching halt to the efforts that were just beginning to be put in place to correct some of the governmental actions that have excluded blacks from the, from the economics of the United States for 360 years. Diversity policies became a, fa a facade for covering up the abuse inflicted on blacks by the United States government. Each class group that receives gratuitous special treatment further dilutes the re and redirects resources away from blacks is a continuous assault. An example of the way groups are gratuitous, gratuitous, gratuitously added to diversity without connection to America's history is the proposal by President Barack Obama in October 2016, his final year in office, to add Middle Eastern people as a new racial category for the census and public policy. This will be the biggest realignment of federal de definitions of race in decades and will further lock native blacks into the lowest level of the nation's rank order of social acceptability. Amazingly, 50 years after the massive influx of immigrants began to displace native black Americans, black elected officials and civil rights leaders remain committed to open door immigration and diversity, even though these policies are injurious to members of their own race. Liberals argue altruistically, 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 altruistically that diversity and recognition of gender, language, and ethnic groups is, group, is good for the nation. Liberal, liberals found practically no resistance when they abandoned Black Americans, whose suffering was out of vogue and eagerly jumped on the bandwagon of diversity. After decades of refocusing the nation's attention away from Blacks to pre preferential treatment and affirmative action for diversity, the nation can easily point to the accomplishments achieved by women, Hispanics, Asians, LGBTs, Arabs, and the handicapped in the corporate boardrooms, contract offices, college classrooms, and government jobs. The gains of Blacks in those categories, however, are minuscule. They're on the bottom of and over, they are on the bottom, and over the past 50 years, those gains are, have mostly evaporated. Black people replaced by diversity remain excluded, abandoned, and quiet. President Donald Trump was unique among presidential candidates in that he acknowledged the needs of black people specifically and promised to address them, but blacks have not yet made an effort to hold him to those promises. Woo! So uh, yeah, so Dr. Claude says, you know, is a deep brother. Uh, his question: What is the history of today's diversity policies? And he's basically just saying that, hey man, the diversity is a word that's kind of created to include all of these minority groups. And as we include all these other minority groups who have not had the suffering uh, of over 400 years of, of, of slavery and backbreaking work as black people. That it actually uh, it actually uh, the, the, uh, reduces the benefits that black people get from these programs that are created for diversity. Very very interesting. Very 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 interesting. Let's see what you guys are saying, talking about here, man. Catch up on these comments, man. Vivian reads up here, man. Right, that's that's oh wow, uh, yeah. Hi, what's going on, Mr. Vet Goodrich? How are you, uh, Boston, Massachusetts? Thanks so much for joining. 
Shawan, Audrey, thank you so much for joining. So that's our, our, our social question of the day that we go through in our Black History series. And I'm doing this series, guys, so that, uh, you know, we can say that there is some place that's focusing on, uh, you know, educating us on Black history, okay? I mean, real Black history. So we got uh, three different books written by Black people that are historical in nature and have their account to um that's not that's not whitewashed right so dr Clyde anderson has his perspective uh, on uh, you know political stuff which i think is important for us to kind of get into understand have some type of concept what do you guys think about this question and and his breakdown of the answer that he had and and, and, and you know any thoughts on that I, I know i did we just did a that, was a that was a long little read but hopefully something uh you know spoke to you or you thought about it, you had an idea about it, as we uh, just read through uh, what Dr. Claude Anderson had to say about the history of today's diversity policies. Today's diversity policies. So, we'll, uh, again, we had our, our, our inventor of the day, which is uh, Dr. Charles Drew. Uh, that's going to be a historical person. I think many of us know Dr. Drew. Uh, and then that was our, 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 our political uh, session, our question today. And now we're going to finish up part one, or which is called Searching for Freedom, which is our main text. Uh, coming from Do the late great Dick Gregory, who wrote the book "Defining Moments in History: Reading Between the Lies." Defining moments in history, reading between the lies, uh, from Doc, uh, from brother Dick Gregory. Okay, so we got three sections to cover here. We're going to start with this section called uh, the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment. And so what this is, guys, is we've got these different little subtitles within a chapter uh, where Dick Gregory goes in and, and shares his take on these different, you know, as you can say, subtopics that we may be familiar with or may not have heard of. And 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 he has his own logic to what really what really going on or what really has happened. The 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment. Let's find out what Brother Dick Gregory has to say about this group. OK, let's read. And I put on my Dick Gregory hat, by the way, because he he writes a little different than Dr. Claude Anderson. Dr. Claude Anderson is is a very serious and 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 you know real structured in his writing. Dick Gregory is a little bit more. I don't know. Put my Dick Gregory hat on. All right, let's go. Let's read. All right. So next time you hear some racists say black people don't want to do anything to help themselves, tell them about the black soldiers who enlisted in the Union Army during the Civil War. See what he has to say then. Truth is, 186,000 black soldiers enlisted. Around 50,000 came from free states and another 40,000 came from what they call border states. Those were slave states that hadn't succeeded, seceded from the Union. In those states, some fought for the Union, some for the Confederacy. But the biggest number of black soldiers, about 93,000, came from the southern states that had left the Union. All of them were called the United States Colored Troops. Mostly they were led by white officers. These white officers weren't exactly fighting each other over the chance to command the blacks, but that changed though, after the blacks proved they could fight well and bravely and after their regiment started to make a name for themselves. It was no different with the black soldiers. Four men from, our, from the all black 54th Massachusetts Infantry. That's the regiment whose story is told in glory. Won medals for gallantry after their assault on Fort Wagner on Morris Island, South Carolina in July of 1863. They were gallant, all right, a whole bunch of them gave up their lives. Just like with everything else black folks tried to do in those days, the first thing black soldiers had to do was convince white folks that they were up for the job. At first, the Union didn't want black soldiers. When the Civil War was heading into their third year and the South was showing no signs of giving up, getting help from black soldiers finally started to seem like a good idea. After, after Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation freeing the slaves, a black leader in Boston named Lewis Hayden Convinced the abolitionist governor of Massachusetts, John Andrew, to put together a regiment of black soldiers. That's how the 54th was born. A Union general, Quincy Gilmer, Quincy Gilmore, wanted to capture South Carolina, which a lot of folks thought of as the heart of the Confederacy. To do that, they had to get past a few strongholds, and one of the strongest was Fort Wagner. Trying to take out Wagner was like trying to knock somebody out in the boxing ring, that is. If the ring were hit, hit were hip deep in water and sand, and your opponent were wearing body armor, Wagner was on a strip of land with the Atlantic on one side and the swamp on the other. The fort was 30 feet high, 200 feet, 
250 by 100 yards in size and made of sand. That might not sound very strong, but it was fortified with logs and sandbags. And it was it had wooden spikes in front of it, spikes sharp enough to go right through you, plus landmines. Step on one of them, and it'd be the last step you'd ever take in your life. Wagner had a moat around it, too. And did I mention the 14 cannons sticking out of it? I give those Southern folks this much. They knew how to play defense. The Union wasn't surprised. Uh, they knew if they just ch charged Fort Wagner, they'd get shot down like ducks. So before they did, they tried firing shells at it. Problem was, Wagner was what they call a bomb-proof roof, was what they called a bomb-proof. Roof beams with 10 feet of sand on top of them. The 54 spent most of the day shooting shells at that thing, and after about 11 hours, it was still standing. Still, the Union figured they had softened it up enough to, so the soldiers could take it. That's where the 54th came in. One of them was Lewis Hayden, Douglas, Frederick Douglass' son. They were commanded by Colonel Robert Gould, Gould Shaw. Skinny white dude, wasn't but 25 years old. His parents were abolitionists at that point. Colonel Shaw ordered 624 men from the 54 to quick march in with muskets and bayonets. As they got closer to Fort Wagner, they started to jog. When they were close enough, the Confederates inside the fort fired on them. Some from the 54 fell, but others kept going. The wooden spikes didn't stop them. They climbed right over that crap. The moat didn't stop them either. All the shelling had half filled it with sand, half filled it with sand. but the Confederates didn't stop firing either. The 54th got mowed down. Colonel Shaw got killed too, as did the waves of soldiers the Union sent in after the 54th. When it was all over, the fort still hadn't fallen. The 54th didn't succeed that day, but they were as brave as all hell. And they were fighting for black folks' freedom and for the country to keep it in one piece, north and south. They made the biggest sacrifice you can make. The 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment. <laughs> uh, that's the take uh, from Brother Dick Gregory uh, as we look into history. Uh, uh, reading between the lies. <laughs> I told you Dick Gregory got a different writing style, guys. I, you know, I'm trying to put my Dick Gregory on. Get my Dick Gregory on. Oh, thanks so much, Miss Miss Goodrich. Uh, next, he uh, covers a topic called Jocko. So this is going to be the second portion of this uh, search for freedom. Jocko. Now, I don't, I don't think I know Jocko, so we'll see what he's talking about here. So here's uh, Dick Gregory's. Um, perspective on the topic of Jocko uh, in his chapter, Search for Freedom in Defining Moments in History, uh, Reading Between the Lies. Let's read. <clears throat> the way something uh, looks is not always the way it is. And what white folks say is definitely not always the truth. Do I really have to remind you of that? For instance, when I was a boy, a friend of mine and I used to go out in the suburbs and throw bricks at those little black jockeys. You know, the ones you see holding lanterns on white folks' lawns. Then one day I said, hey, man, something's not right about this. Jockeys don't carry lanterns. We decided to see what was up. We got to looking and looking and looking. Then I found out that the jockey who started it all, the one behind those statues, wasn't a jockey at all. He was a 12-year-old boy, and are you ready? General George Washington's number one was number one war strategist. Name was Jocko Graves. He was the son of Tom Graves, a free black man in Washington's army. Jocko wanted to fight in the army too, but he was too young. That didn't stop him from traveling with Washington and the troops. That little black boy wanted to go, so he went. Simple as that. One morning, Jocko saw General Washington, and it looked like something was bothering him. So Jocko said, what's wrong, Pop? Washington said, ah, nothing. Jocko said, come on, you're worried about something. Washington told him, we think the British are going to come in at this point down here, and we'll be waiting for them but there's a possibility they'll come in over there. I can't divide my troops. That 12 year old said, don't worry. I think you're right, but give me that lantern. If I if they come that way, I can see them. If they come around that bend, it turned out George Washington was right. His army battled the British all night, killed them all. When Washington ran over to where Jocko was holding the lantern to keep a lookout for the British, he saw that the boy had frozen to death. Now that's loyalty. That's why I say you can't trust what white folks tell you. They reduce that story down to just some little some little tar black jockey looking kid holding a lantern on white folks lawns. When the real story is about loyalty. 12 year old black boy froze to death protecting the American revolutionary. 
Even the white folks who know the story tell it wrong. According to them, Jocko froze to death holding the reins of Washington's horses. This shows Jocko's loyalty, but holding reins didn't require brains. Don't pay attention to that mess. <laughs> Don't pay attention to that mess. Isn't it great to get a view of history from the eyes of a black man? I'm telling you. Dick Gregory didn't soften the truth. I know that's right, brother, uh, uh, sister, sister Reed. Oh, yeah, reading between the, not the lies, reading between the lies, the lies, reading between the lies. We're reading between the lies. And our last portion that we'll cover here tonight, uh, I hope you guys have been enjoying or uh, reading a little bit of Black History as we're uh, hearing from the mind and the perspective of Dick Gregory, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Oh, this might be interesting. Let's see what Dick Gregory has to say about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Let's read. Uh, people talk about Abraham Lincoln like he was the best friend black folks ever had because he freed the slaves. Lincoln didn't care a thing about black folks. And he sure wasn't their best friend. Now you can look this up. Lincoln met with a room full of black men in the White House and told them they weren't as smart as white folks. One of his ideas for what to do after slavery was round up black folks and send them to another country. Think about your best friend. Would he or she tell you to your face you're as stupid as the day is long and then try to get you to move out of the country? If the answer is yes, you need a new best friend. Or else maybe your friend is right about the stupid part. Lincoln didn't care one way or another about black folks or about slavery either. He wanted to preserve the union, that's all. Here's what he said, if I could save the union without freeing my slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would do that. Now, maybe that doesn't sound like somebody who hates black people. It doesn't exactly sound like somebody with their best interests at heart either, does it? Abraham Lincoln was a white man of his time, was a white man of his time. That's the long and the short of it. Folks say Lincoln got killed for freeing black folks. Maybe, maybe not. Think about this a minute. Lincoln was the president during the Civil War after the Southern states had succeeded to, from the United States and he had to find a way to preserve the union he cared so much about. You know, the one blacks built for free during slavery. Now it takes money to fight a war. If you're fighting in the army, but you don't get paid pretty soon, you might just stop fighting. Plus you've got to eat. The government has to pay for all that. Well, the government didn't have enough money. So Lincoln went to the banks in New York and asked to borrow what he needed. The bank says, sure, but you have to pay us back at 36% interest. That meant the U.S. government would have to pay the banks back every dime it borrowed, plus another one-third on top of that. That's like if you ask your neighbor to borrow a screwdriver, he says, yeah, sure, you can borrow, but you bring it back when you give me some screws along with it. Lincoln said, later, for that. What did Lincoln do instead? Uh, he ordered the government to print money, called it greenbacks. Before that point in United States history, any time the government printed a dollar, it had to have a dollar's worth of gold to back it up. But with the North fighting a war and Lincoln needing a way to pay for it, in 1862, Lincoln said, go ahead and print money. That way, the thinking went, the government would, uh, wouldn't owe money to the banks. All this new money was floating around and the banks didn't have the thing to do with it. If you think the banks like that, think again. Now, go forward almost exactly 100 years when we had another president who was supposed to be a friend of black folks, John F. Kennedy, comes into office, starts making all kinds of noise about what he's going to do for blacks. Of course, he didn't get a chance to do it if that's what he was really going to do because in Dallas, Texas, uh, on November 22nd of 1963, he was assassinated. All his plans fell to his vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson. People like to say Kennedy was killed for what he wanted to do for black folks, maybe. Maybe not. Look here. On June 4th of 1963, Kennedy signed executive order number 11, 11,110, 11, which allowed the United States government once again to print money without going through the Federal Reserve Bank. In other words, the government could get money without owing one thin dime to the bankers. So once again, there was new money, but no action for the banks. The whole reason the Federal Reserve exists is to lend money to the government and get paid back with interest. If it can't do that, it's out of business. If you think the Federal Reserve bankers wanted that, think again. Kennedy got killed five months later. Folks said it was because he supported civil rights, but he was also one of the two presidents who tried to get around the banks. The other one was Abraham Lincoln. What do you think? <laughs> uh, 
What do you think? Man, defining moments in history, reading between the lies from Brother Dick Gregory. As you can see, man, we got three different books, three different writing styles, three different personalities. Uh, hopefully, I did a good job of sharing this with you here tonight on the New Back Wall Street Book Club. I love the way that Dick Gregory writes. I, I just love the way he thinks as he is writing because he's he definitely off the cuff. He he, you know, he he keep it real in his own little way. Absolutely, man. Let's see what you guys are saying here in the comments, man. Vivian Reed say, hey, then there was no gold to back and paper. Absolutely, no gold to back and paper either. So, again, guys, uh, this is Black History Series Part 4. Uh, we had our African-American Adventures that changed the world where we covered Dr. Charles Drew. We had our uh, question, uh, 101 questions that you never thought to ask about Black history, which covered the question, uh, what is the history of today's diversity policies? That was written by Dr. Char Dr. Claude Anderson. And we just uh, finished chapter one uh, for the book written by Brother Dick Gregory, Defining Moments in Black History. This is the New Black Wall Street Book Club, where black folk do read. If you put it in the book, like African-American Adventures That Changed the World, if you put it in the book, like a black history reader, 101 questions that you never thought to ask, if you put it in the book, like Defining Moments in History, Reading Between the Lies, we absolutely will find it. I want you guys to remember this, that it takes a village. It starts with us. Let's build as we climb together. We all we got, beautiful people. Matter of fact, we all we need. And thank God that's more than enough. Until next episode, you know what time it is. Mr. DJ, hit the music. New, new, new black, new. It's the new black Wall Street Book Club. Wall Street. With your host, Evan Jefferson. Evan Jefferson. It's time for us to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you ain't got to leave the computer. But we encourage you to get out there and learn and apply all the things you learn at the new black Wall Street Book Club. Book Club. Yeah. The new black Wall Street. The new black Wall Street.